Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today's lesson will be on bass drum. This is an orchestral bass drum, better known in Italian as a gran casa. You saw there that I was playing various notes of different dynamics, as well as playing tog, which means together, T-O-G, and that's bass drum and cymbal together. That's used a lot when you play opera. You can uh, do that with one player, and then notes are going to be together. Also, it's a proper sound for a lot of things. So when you have a cymbal on the bass drum, one player can control the dynamic perfectly, from soft notes to loud notes. So we'll be talking about that a lot in a couple minutes. But first, let's talk about the bass drum. This is one of the lowest instruments in the orchestra, besides the tuba and the contrabass bassoon. Also, if you're playing something with an organ, that can go just as low. But this instrument, especially a large one, if you're using like a 40-inch bass drum to play Verdi or something, they can be incredibly low. You really can test out your subwoofer on your stereo system with these. So this bass drum is, is small. This is my own, and uh, it's not a great bass drum. It's a pearl just normal utility drum. Uh, it's only 32 inches. Normally, uh, symphony drums can range from about 34 to 42. They can be bigger, but they're hard to control when they're that big. Also, the head I have on here today is a fiber skin head. That's because the weather here, uh, this time of year, it's May, well, almost May. It's the end of April, and the heads can get pretty funny, the calf heads, because it's raining one day, it's humid the next, and it's dry. So I normally take off my calf heads this time of year so I'm not having to babysit them. But just so you know, this is a calf head, so you can see it, that I use. I have two of these, and I'll take them on and off. And I tuck these myself on wooden rims, and they are difficult to tuck. You need a, a swimming pool, a kid's swimming pool to tuck them. You can't tuck them in the tub, they're too big. So I use a kiddie pool and um, I only fill it up once in a while because my kids are all grown up, but, uh, but that's how I do it. Okay, so I have several of these and I try not to break them, but these are beautiful heads and I've had them a long time. So you see how tight that is right now because it's pretty cold and yesterday it was rainy and humid. So it changes on a dime here, the weather does at this time of year. So, being this is a 32, it does not go as low as a lot of bass drums would that are bigger. It's also not very deep. It's pretty shallow. Bass drums can be very deep. Uh, you know, I've seen them, like the Lafima drums from Europe can be as deep as 22, 23 inches. This drum here is probably about 14, well, probably about 16 inches deep with the rims. So it's, it's a good utility drum, and I use this drum to play shows. I rent it out. Uh, sometimes I use it with a small orchestra, but again, it wouldn't have the power and the depth to use with a big orchestra. Also, cheaper drums like this are liable to rattle a lot, so you gotta stay on them. Uh, all bass drums are gonna rattle to a certain extent unless you babysit them constantly. There's parts on the uh, stands that will rattle. The drums themselves, the lug casings will rattle. The rims will rattle, so you always have to stay on that. This particular drum is on a pearl rolling stand. I'm not going to take it off right now, but you can look those up. They're good utility stands. It's got a footrest, and I've had it for years. It's fine. Uh, but most orchestra bass drums are mounted on a suspended stand, which would be like a hoop, and then you'd have the bass drum on some sort of very thick rubber bands, floating, suspended. All right, kind of like if you play drum set, it would be like the rim system, the old rim system, where the tom is floating so it could ring more. If the bass drum is, is not on that kind of stand, it's not going to ring as much, like this drum. And ring is important when you want a big note, and it also contributes to a good amount of volume. Now, as far as tuning goes, I do tune my bass drum to a certain pitch, uh, depending on what drum it is. So normally for a 34, we have a a 34 or a 36. In the orchestra, we have a 36. I tune that to a D, 
a low D. Uh, and I try to tune both heads the same, so it's got maximum amount of ring. This particular drum, I'll usually tune to an E or maybe an F, a uh, half step above an E, so, uh, because it's a smaller drum. And if you tune it too low, it'll bottom out on you. Uh, today, the drum is, is tuned pretty low, uh, so I can try to get some depth for you. Now, as far as mallets go, it's important to choose the right mallet for the drum. So if you have a smaller drum, you use a lighter mallet. This particular mallet is a Tom Freer bass drum mallet. I really like these. He makes two sizes. There's one bigger than this. We have the other one in the orchestra hall. This is my own. And it's got two ends, a hard end that sounds like this, and a softer end that sounds like this. So they're very close because the heads on these beaters are small. And you can also wrap another piece of felt around here if you want. This one's getting a little warm, uh, worn out. The good thing about the soft part is, uh, of the beater is when you play soft, there's no contact noise. Whereas if I use the green part, the hard part, it sounds like this. So a two-ended mallet is a really great thing to have. Now they also make two-ended mallets made for rolling, like this Mike Balter mallet. So. so you could use one mallet to roll while the other hand is doing something else. And also it's a utility mallet as well because one is smaller than the other. All right, so we're gonna do a lot about mallets in a minute, but I just wanted to show you how this bass drum sounded with a standard mallet that's a good size for this drum. You don't wanna use a mallet that's too big or you'll overwhelm the drum. So you see this cymbal mount here. So these mounts, I'll take it off so I can show you. Uh, this is an older cymbal mount. Very old. Oh, there you go. <laughs> have to fix that. And I have a K Zildjian, an old K on here that I really like. I have a number of old Ks. This one's my favorite for playing TOG. Uh, in other words, bass drum and cymbal together. So this apparatus here that just fell apart, uh, it's got some clamps that clamp onto the bass drum hoop and it's got some felt and it's very simple and then you just put it on the drum and you want, might want to line the bottom with some felt and it works great except for falling apart sometimes and then this little thing here is my little muffler that I use all right so I can use my hand or I can use this muffle if I just use my hand it sounds like this if I use a muffle, it covers more surface, and it sounds like this. Much more dead. Now, most bass drum stands will have a footrest. You see how my uh, knee is up here? And what you can do is you can muffle the drum with your leg like that. So when you're playing, you kind of hug the drum, and you play very dry. So you can especially do that when you're playing tog with the cymbal. Also, if you want, if you're playing on a really big bass drum, what you can do, because that has more surface, it's going to ring longer, you can put a towel on your leg and muffle it like that. So it'll be really dry now. Almost sounds like a, a kick drum from a, from a drum set. So that's an option with a bigger bass drum. This bass drum doesn't really need that at all. Now let's talk about playing area. So uh, since we don't have a lot of real estate on this drum, there's not a big playing area. On the bigger drums, there's obviously more of a playing area. Normally, for general playing, you're going to play right above or right below the center of the drum. So here or here. For big shots, marcato notes, you'll play right in the center. Like all drums, that is the tightest part of the head. It's where the most tension is. For instance, if you play on a timpani and you play in the center of the drum, 
you're going to get a super dry sound. It doesn't really sound like a timpani because all the tension's there. So on a timpani, you play on the edge and you get more ring. So it's the same for a bass drum, but you use that to your advantage. So again, general playing is just about two or three inches above the center. So you're still getting some definition and you're still getting uh, some ring. But when you start playing in the middle, then you're getting a more focused sound. Now, depending on the drum, you can play a lot in the middle. Whatever really sounds best is fine. There's no rules, okay? You just have to kind of fish around, especially on a calf head. Certain calf heads are going to have sweet spots. In other words, I have one calf head I use for the front and one I use for the back. The thicker one is for the front, and I have a little bit thinner one for the back. All right, and that helps with not breaking the head, of course. Now, for rolls, you're going to use some softer mallets, like these uh, old Al Payson rollers. Not sure if these are made anymore, but I like them. And you can do this a few ways. Now, if you play traditional, this helps a lot because it's awkward to play match like that. It kind of hurts. So traditional, you can do right here. Or you can do below. If you play match, you're probably better off doing this. Either way, once again, there's no rule. Fish around for the best spot. So you can even play traditional like this. And as you hear, this, uh, this little apparatus is now rattling because I took it apart and it fell apart. So that's how you roll on a bass drum. Okay, two mallets like that. Now again, I showed you the one-handed roll before. That's fine. So, and you have to do that sometimes if your other hand has has to do something. So we're going to take a little pause for a second. I'm going to fix this thing, and then I'll take out a bunch of mallets, and I'll show you some different mallets for the bass drum. Okay, we're back, all fixed, no problem. Good, so let's show you some different mallets. Sometimes you have to play very fast and articulate. Uh, these Tom Geiger mallets are great for that. They're made by Vic Firth now. And uh, there's certain excerpts, Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, which uses two bass drums. He kind of used two or more of everything. He was very into percussion. Uh, you'll need a hard mallet for that. So this is a good choice. Also Stravinsky's Ride of Spring has a huge bass drum part that you, plays very fast notes. So you need articulation. So you have a couple choices for that. Uh, I like to use these for that kind of thing. Okay, so they're very articulate. Now, a lot of times when I play these kinds of parts, I'll flatten out a bass drum. So in other words, we'll f the bass drum will be flat. And I have another bass drum, and in, uh, in a minute, we'll take a break, and I'll set that up so you can see how that works. That'll be the last thing we do. And you can play it like a regular drum, and that's so much easier than playing the bass drum like this. Uh, so bass drums do turn flat. This particular one does not because of the stand it's on. But ones that are suspended will do that. So that's a really good thing to have. So also, these mallets have a wood part to them, which is very articulate. And of course, that's much easier playing match grip like this. And we'll show you that later. Okay? So this is a mallet I highly recommend. He makes a bigger one too, but it's a little heavy and cumbersome to, to do that kind of fast stuff. Some other articulate mallets you might want to investigate are these Grover. Um, they're made of bamboo. It's an ultra staccato bass drum mallet. I really like these. They're not as hard as those, but they're heavier. These sound great on Mahler 3, which has a big bass drum solo. I've used them for that. Uh, and they sound pretty deep for what they are. So they have, they have a lot of weight. And they're very easy to play. You don't want to use a heavy mallet 
for that kind of excerpt or you'll end up playing uneven. And it's basically just you, so uh, it has to be very clean. So, also, there's these mallets that I really like. And these are made by Dragonfly. These are uh, double-sided mallets. In other words, the head has a soft side and a hard side. These are great mallets. So I use these a lot. They have a lot of weight to them. So that's the hard side. And here's the soft side. So if you're playing something like this, like Sibelius or something which has a lot of bass drum rolls and you got to play articulate you can just flip the mallet like that and you're good to go very very useful so I highly recommend these uh, to use okay we also have um, a very hard mallet which is nice and cheap this is a Mike Balter concert bass drum mallet and it's hard felt and this is good on smaller bass drums like this You notice there I'm kind of playing in the middle for articulation. So this is nice and light. So this is a good mallet that won't break the bank. Some of these mallets are very expensive. But this is pretty cheap compare, compare in comparison. All right. Then there's these innovative percussion mallets, which are nice. But these are too heavy and big for this bass drum. This is a good example of overpowering the drum. These weigh a ton. So... Now the good thing about playing this, your technique, all you have to do is use the weight of the beater, which is good technique anyway, and just drop the mallet. So there I'm depending on the weight of the mallet to get my sound, which ideally is what you want to do. So a heavy mallet will get you a better sound because it's got more depth. All right, and then we have an even heavier, softer, innovative mallet that looks like this. This mallet's so heavy and big, it's actually moving the drum over. So I'll have to move it back. <laughs> All right. And you probably can see throughout this video this head really vibrating a lot. That happens on all bass drums. The head is very loose on these things. So uh, if you can see that, it's like water. All right? And the bigger the mallet, the bigger the wave's going to be. Finally, we have these things, and these are called ruta. These are supposed to be tree roots. And a lot of times you play them on the rim. Now, uh, Mahler, Gustav Mahler, wrote a lot of stuff for ruta in, in, in his symphonies. So it's normally played on the rim of the drum. But you can also play it on the bass drum. And I've played contemporary pieces that use that. Uh, these are great. They're made by um, Vic, uh, Vic Firth. It's part of the Emil Richards series. If you can find them, I guess they're still made. These have gotten a lot of use. Originally, it was supposed to be tree roots, so I could just imagine someone just you know, walking in with a tree root and playing the bass drum with it. Uh, you can use wooden dowels bundled together, but this is just bamboo. You could make something like this. But these are great. They're very comfortable, and you can play intricate rhythms. So they're, they're very controllable, okay? So, Ruta. All right, let's talk a little about some bass drum accessories. So uh, there's a lot of them out there. You saw this one, this muffle. That's made by Equilibrium. I like it because it straps onto the bass drum. You can also just take a towel and drape it over the drum if you don't want to spend any money. We do that sometimes and just do that. And that will muffle the drum. It's not as elegant. Just please use a black towel so it matches the bass drum. But All right, so that's the solution. Or you can get one of these. And when you're not using it, you could just tuck it away like that. So it's it's a good product. 
Also, I showed you that symbol map before that fell apart, all right, so don't take it off the bass drum. Uh, I have another one here that's actually pretty good, all right. This is um, called a sim, sim belt. Uh, it's a bass drum symbol attachment. And what it does, see if I don't chop my fingers off here, it slides like this. So it'll fit any bass drum. And what you do is you put it on here and you just do that and put a symbol on there. All right, now these are great. Uh, it's a great idea, it works really well. The only problem I've had, sometimes they, they work loose. Uh, you gotta really tighten them down. This part's for holding the symbol and it tightens it and this part tightens it. So be careful, because if it's not tightened down like a lot, it'll work itself loose and start falling, falling apart at the worst moment. That's why I like this one, even though it's flimsy, uh, a little on this end with clamps, you know, you can't really get it off cleanly, but I always leave it on there, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but I like this just because it's so unbelievably secure. And also you can tilt the symbol like that, which is great, and you can't do that with this. So if you have a particular angle, and I'm pretty short, so I tend to have to have this lower, but then if there's a taller player and they want to move it, you know, they can tilt this symbol up either way, okay? So it makes it easier. But that's an option uh, for you, for sure. Then there's certain other kinds of bass drum uh, mufflers that look like this. This one's made by Lafema. And what these do, these hook up on here like so. This one has to be loosened. And the only problem with these are they're a little bit noisy. They'll rattle. So I don't really ever use these. I use them more on my drum set than anything. So if you listen to it, you're probably hearing that rattle as I'm hitting it. Got the mallet here. So it's kind of a little bit clumsy. Now, uh, they usually make great stuff. This is not one of their better endeavors here, okay? But there's several of these that you can get. I have a really old one. This is ancient. All right, I don't even, I can't remember where I got this, but this one rattles real good. <laughs> so, all right, and then we also have a handy contraption here. If you watched my cymbal video, you saw this. Uh, this is a mount for uh, Piatti. And what you can do is you can attach this. If you have a bass drum with um, the ring there, you can attach this onto it, the suspension ring, and then you got a cymbal right there, and it moves around with the bass drum rather than having a separate cymbal stand. So I use this a lot. I highly recommend it. All right. Okay, let's talk about TOG. So if you watched my cymbal video, I talked a little about this, and I just gave you a demo in the beginning of this video. So once again, this is important if you're going to play any kind of opera, uh, any kind of march. There's obviously parts, well, if you don't know the parts. In Petrushka, there's a big bass drum cymbal thing. He wants one person to play it. So, so you're basically doing that, OK? And also, you can, um, uh, some Beethoven, Beethoven 9, you can also do that if you're short a player. It's only three players in the last movement. And there's a lot of, uh, like I said, opera excerpts. And sometimes even composers will write it uh, like they want it. In other words, they'll have a stem up and a stem down. Uh, one will be cymbals, one will be bass drum. So any kind of Rossini overture, you can do it. Anything that's not too loud. And again, it's good sometimes if you're short players, obviously. But also, you're guaranteed to have the bass drum and cymbals together. Okay, the only bad thing about it is it's hard to get big giant crashes. So this is probably as loud as you'd want to get. Now the technique's a little different for doing this than it is when you're playing Piatti. Again, watch my Piatti, vi Piatti videos and you'll see that. But in this case, you don't want to get any um, uh, of that suction sound, you know, the air pockets. So what I do is I move up like this and I offset the cymbal. So it is a completely different technique that you have to work on. Otherwise, 
it just won't sound good. You'll get those air pockets. And if you can do that, you'll never miss. Now for soft playing, which is very common and difficult like this, I first start with the cymbal on the other cymbal. Okay, and I'll start like that before I play, and then I just bring it up and start. All right, but it's difficult and you're gonna have to practice. And your arm will get tired, so I recommend using a light cymbal. These are these Minels. I showed these also as well in that Piotti video. And these are 18s. An 18 is a good size. Uh, you can go smaller, but then you can't do any big crashing. So I use 18s. And I like a nice dark sound, so this old K and this Minel sound great together. Now let's talk about muffling. This is tricky, okay? So there's two parts to this. A lot of times you gotta play a short note. So one thing you need to do is have your pad on there and your knee, and you might wanna put your towel on your knee for that. So remember we did that. See if I can do this without breaking anything. Okay. So like that, all right? And this doesn't look so good, but that's fine. So now you can play dry. All right, now the back head's still gonna ring. That's just the way it goes. Uh, normally you could put your other hand around that to muffle it, but right now my hand's busy. But that's how you do it, all right? So you'd hit, and then you'd grab this symbol after you hit the bass drum and this one goes right against your body at the same time so in slow motion once again and now faster okay that's how you do it. You just got to practice. And, they, and that's extremely common. You need to do that to be able to play short notes. So just repetition. And once you get that motion, you're not thinking about it. It's just automatic, like driving or riding a bike. All right, good. So let's take a little pause. And then I'll bring back uh, a smaller bass drum that I can lay flat. And we'll just show you that real quick. Okay, we're back with a uh, bass drum that's mounted flat. This is a majestic bass drum. I've had this for a long time. It's a 28. It just does this. So no big deal there. And um, it'll go straight or flat. So this is a good utility drum. It's small. It's only 28 inches, but I do use this a lot for shows. It doesn't go very deep, but it's pretty loud. So one thing you need to do when you play a drum like this is you need to muffle it a little. Well, I'll just show you. When you play it wide open, it sounds like this. Probably sounds pretty good. We'll have to see when we hear, hear the recording. But normally you'd want it a little bit drier. So what I do is I use these binder clips and just a black heavy cloth napkin. You can also use a towel, but I find the towel is a little too much. And then you just clip it to the brim and that's it. You're done. Okay? And you could fold it over a little to get less muffling. drum's rattling a little bit. Let's see if we can fix that. So just like any bass drum, it's got a lot of screws and lugs, and you just got to make sure everything's tight. So that's inevitably what will happen. All right, so before you play, before the concert, as you're tuning the drum, which you need to do before every concert, uh, maybe even at intermission, uh, you need to check that drum for rings. And just warn everybody in front of you that you're going to have to hit it pretty hard to find any kind of ringing rattles or anything like that. So, you know, it's important to do that. Don't be lazy. Uh, you want everything to sound great at all times, okay? Now, if I put more of this on there, it sounds even drier. That'll make your life a lot easier if you can have a bass drum that you can lay flat. So it's very important uh, that, you know, your orchestra, if you're in an orchestra, that you can obviously lay a bass drum flat or get a smaller one like this. 
a bass room like this is usually plenty of volume for a concert hall, especially on any kind of contemporary piece. Pearl also makes an interesting thing now where you can mount a drum set bass drum on legs. My buddy showed me that a couple years ago. And that's great because you could take any drum set bass drum and put legs on it. So if you got a 22 or 24, you got one of these immediately. And you don't have to pay the, you know, thousand dollars or whatever these cost to, to have it. So that's something to look into. So I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you next time.